In the first segment of this lecture, I gave you the Levenstein algorithm, which is a beautiful, elegant algorithm. Now, if your purpose is to learn this algorithm, just in case you're passing in pro programming interview, an interview for a programmer's job, and you're asked uh, what the algorithm uh, is, well, then you can just uh, learn it. But I didn't tell you why it works. Uh, it's just uh, shrouded in a mystery. So in the second segment, we are going to see uh, what lies behind the uh, mystery. And what lies behind the mystery is a loop invariant. Looking into the loop invariant for this algorithm is going to remove the mystery completely so that you will be able to believe that you have learned this algorithm since uh, kindergarten. If you, and if you forget any detail, for example, during that dreaded programming interview, then you will be able to reconstruct it. Why does this thing work? Well, there is a loop invariant. And the loop invariant tells us that after pro processing J entries in the ith row, we have in the matrix, remember that it was called dist, the distances for all the substrings computed so far. So it's very simple. It's just that we have computed a partial solution. We want a solution to the complete problem and we are going to get, uh, to get it as uh, remember in the last entry of the matrix. But as we go, you know, uh, as we little by little uh, fill the entries row by row and in each row column by column, what we compute in these entries is the corresponding distances uh, between the uh, fields, the, the uh, prefixes, the initial strings of the source string and the target string. So in the invariant, which is the property that it will hold again and again through the loop, tells us that what we have already computed in this matrix at position ij is simply the uh, solution to the final problem, but limited to a partial part of the problem. And the, this uh, partial set of the problem is the element from a, a certain um, uh, substrate of the source, for example, BEET, to a certain substring of the uh, target. So example, for example, BEAT. So at this point, we actually have not uh, computed yet that particular entry, but we have computed all the previous entries. And so how do we uh, compute the next entry. You know, and let's, let's assume this is really very much like an induction hypothesis in uh, standard mathematics that all these entries are here that we've computed so far are the Levenstein distances between the corresponding substrings, uh, prefix substrings of the source and the target. So how do we compute now the distance from BEET to BEAT? Well, in this case, the letters are the same. So we know that by the induction hypothesis, by the loop invariant, we can go in one transformation from the substring BEE to the target to the substring of the target BEA. So how do we go with one more letter? Well, we can just add the same letter on both sides uh, since they are the same. So this is this was our first rule that in this case, uh, if the letters are the same, we keep the top left entry. Now let's look to let's look at the next case in which the values were different. Of course, this is the core of the algorithm. And we know, for example, that we can go from BEE -E to BEAT in two operations and so on. So how do we go from BEET to BEATL? Well, there are three ways we could go there. So the one that actually turns, it, turns out to be the best, but let's assume, let's ignore for a, se for a second the values one, two, three, which are highlighted. How could we go from BEET to BEATL, knowing that we already know ways for all the substrings. Well, one way to go from BEET 
to BEATL, knowing that here we can go from BEET to BEAT is simply to add an L. So that's an insertion. That's why it says I here. Another way, knowing that we have already computed all these previous transformations, would be since we know we can go from BEE here to BEATL there in three operations, we could simply delete the T and that's it. We get our BATL. And the third way, <clears throat> knowing that we can go from BEE -E to BEAT in two operations would be to add an operation, which is a substitution replacing the letter T at position four by the letter I. I'm sorry, L. So that would be a substitution. So these are the three ways in which building on the previous partial solutions that we have already obtained by the invariant hypothesis, we, can ex we could extend by one more. And so if we take the minimum of those three, then we have the guarantee that we restore the invariant again. That is to say, we have the minimum set of transformations for one more entry, the new entry that we have looked at here. So that's it. That is that is the reason for the algorithm. And in I4, you can express this uh, as part of a specific clause, which is part of the I4 language. Here, we express it informally in English, for, you know, for all P and so on. This uh, just repeats a little bit more precisely what I, I said before, where we can go from A uh, to uh, I, J to um, for, and we can go from source from one to A to tiger to, to uh, one to J for all the previous entries. This is what the invariant uh, also says uh, here. We could express it mathematically, but I'm not going to go into this. This requires a bit more baggage than I'm ready to introduce in this particular lecture. The informal invariant is good enough for our purposes. And what the invariant says is something very simple. It says we have solved this general problem, the final problem for a part of the input, where the input is the combination of a source string and a target string. So we have solved the problem for all the prefixes of the source string and the target string encountered so far, and for which we have filled the corresponding entries in the table. What is a loop invariant? Well, the general idea is clear from, from what we have seen in this example. It's a property that we preserve through the loop. It's a concept that is very similar to the concept of induction in mathematics. So in mathematics, if you, one way to prove that a property holds for all integers, actually the best way, the, the most general way to prove that a property holds for any, all integers, if it's too difficult to prove it directly, is to prove it by induction. And the way you prove it by induction is that you reduce the difficult problem of proving a property P of N for every N to two sim generally much simpler problems. First problem, prove that P holds for zero, P of zero. Second problem, prove that if it holds for an arbitrary integer I, it also holds for I plus one. So P of I implies P of I plus one. So that's what induction is, it's a problem solving technique, which reduces a complicated problem into two simpler problems. A loop is essentially the same thing. It's a problem solving technique that works when you are trying to achieve a certain result that you cannot achieve directly, but you can achieve it by successive approximation. So to illustrate this, this is not going to be a formal you know, topological and a describe a representation, it's only a metaphor, it illustrates the ideas. We're looking for a certain solution to a certain problem. And in general, there's more than one possible solution. So that's why here I've represented the uh, set of solutions by not just by one point, by, but by this uh, uh, little area here. So we are trying to shoot, so to speak, into that solution said, but we have no way to, we have not found a way to 
reach it directly. So we're going to reach it by successive approximation. The first thing we do is that we're going to plunge, so to speak, the solution space into a much bigger space where, where we know the solution or solutions lie, okay? That's the invariant. It's this bigger space, which approximates maybe very badly the set of solutions, but it will give us a place to start from. And so the set of solutions will be the intersection of the set of, in, uh, of invariant uh, elements, uh, invariant points in that space and a, a certain exit condition. So we express the final condition as an end, as a conjunction, or the same thing as an intersection of two properties, the invariant, which is the generalization of the so, uh, condition that we're seeking to achieve and an, an exit condition. And then we, uh, the general strategy is that we're going, to, we're going to start by going into the invariant area. So we start from the previous state of the computation and we must make sure that the initialization, the, the first operation of the loop before the actual looping uh, occurs, lands us into the invariant area, which is usually, usually not too hard because the invariant is much more general, much easier to satisfy than the final condition that we're trying to reach. And then the loop proper, the iteration is going to be executing a body. And what's the purpose of the body is to get us closer to the exit condition without of course ever leaving the invariant. That's a no-no, we can never get out of the invariant, we're going to stay there. So what by doing so, we have reduced the difficult problem of reaching a solution. We have reduced it to two, uh, in, in principle, in, may, in, in good cases at least, much easier problems. One, land into the invariant. Second, get closer to the exit condition without le ever leaving the invariant. And of course, if we have done our job well, in particular, if the body actually gets us closer each time to the exit condition, which is going to be measured by something else, which I'm not covering today, which is the loop variant, which is a measure of the distance uh, uh, to the exit condition. So we have the invariant, which characterizes where we are, the uh, superset of the set of possible solutions and the variant, which is some kind of measure of the distance to the solution. And when the variant reaches zero, or, uh, then we, are, we have an exit condition. So this is what a loop is, okay, viewed as a problem solving method. And this is a very general notion. And I would say that behind every loop, there is an invariant. And I would go further by saying that you don't under you don't really understand the loop unless you know where the invariant is. Let me refer you here to a paper that a few years ago, a uh, couple of uh, courses, Carlo Furia, who is now with uh, Uzi in uh, Lugano and Sergei Verde from uh, ITMO in uh, St. Petersburg, wrote, we wrote it together. It's a survey paper, so it's not a research paper in the sense of finding new, new algorithms or new results. It's actually a study of known algorithms, but with the original viewpoint of looking into the invariance. So that's what we do in this article, classification of uh, loop invariance and classification of loops, of, of loop algorithms by their invariant and explaining the invariant that lies uh, behind the, each of these loops. So as you can see from the table of contents, we looked at a rather diverse set of algorithms from array searching to our arithmetic uh, algorithms to sorting algorithms, you know, quick sort in particular, the, the core of quick sort, which is the partitioning part of quicksort, but also selection sort, insertion sort, and others. We looked at dynamic programming, which is really what where Levenstein distance is, and I will go, come back to that aspect later on. But we also looked at algorithms in uh, uh, computational geometry, uh, rotating calipers, algorithms on data structures, and even page rank, which was the invention that lay uh, behind uh, Google and which is used by all modern, modern search engines. 
so you is this algorithm is easy to find it, of course in the last uh, slide and in the website associated with these lectures i give you all the pointers to the references that i mentioned and uh, to to the group so this is really what is the secret which is for you no longer a secret behind the effectiveness simplicity elegance and power of uh, the levenstein distance algorithm but this is not the whole story Okay, it, it is the story, it, it really tells us the real story, but we can say more. And in the third segment of this lecture, I'm going to look into ways to consider this algorithm from a different perspective, and that this different perspective is going to be the perspective of recursive programming. So I'll see you again for the third segment with uh, detour through recursion.